Today is April 7, 2023, and we have a very special guest on the show today, Christian Mehta. Christian Mehta is a former partner at PricewaterhouseCooper and served in their New York, London, and Tokyo offices. While in Tokyo, he was in charge of the firm's U.S. tax practice in Asia and, and with oversight for, for offices in Japan, China, Singapore, Malaysia, and India. Christian is a current a single university, co-teaching a course on global trade, tax, and social justice. Along with his wife, Christian is co-founder of Asia Initiatives, an organization devoted to women's empowerment in Asia and Africa. Christian also serves on the board of uh, Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver, the Nation Fund for Independent Journalism in New York, the Center for Citizen Initiatives, the American Committee for U.S.-Russia Accord, the Human Rights Watch Foundation in Japan, and Save Life Foundation in India. Christian also has also been co-chair of Global Financial Integrity in Washington, D.C., and the director of the Tax Justice Network in London. Christian has been a guest speaker at the Fletch, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy in Boston and at Tokyo University in Japan on issues of tax and social justice. Christian is an engineer by training, has an MBA, and is a US CPA. Christian, I could go on and on um, all the different things you've done, um, but thank you so much for coming on the show and welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting. Well, today I wanted to talk to you about a very important article you wrote entitled, Why Much of the Global South Isn't Automatically Supporting the West in Ukraine which was published on February 28th, 2023 in Counterpunch. Why did you think it was important to write this article and what exactly is the Global South saying? Ryan, the article is an extension of my hope for peace. As you know, the war in Ukraine has divided families, friends, countries. There's been a lot of anger about why the Global South is is not supporting the West in Ukraine, why they're not sanctioning Russia in, in, in this crisis. And, you know, whenever there's anger that is expressed of this nature, I always try to look for the other side. Is there another perspective here? As you know, the fourth century philosopher, St. Augustine said that hope has two beautiful daughters, anger and courage. Anger at the way things are or the way that people are acting and courage to do something about it, to try to understand, to try to explain why people are doing what they're doing. And it was from that perspective that I, I dug deeper, talked to many people, spoke to a number of different constituents from the Global South to try to understand their perspective on why they were not supporting the West in Ukraine and they were not sanctioning Russia. And as you know, um, Almost 80% of the world's population is not supporting the West. And as I drill deeper into this and try to understand it, I came to the conclusion that there were five fundamental reasons why that was the case. And let me outline them for you. And then during this interview, we can elaborate on these five main points. The first was that I, I feel that many people, many countries in the global South feel that the West does not understand or empathize with its problems. Uh, the problems of the global South are very unique. They deal with poverty, inflation, debt service, famine, uh, hunger, malnutrition, all of these things which are being aggravated by the war in Ukraine, but West has not really helped the global South on these problems, but it is pressing the global South on the solution or on the sanctioning of, of Russia about this war. So the first point I'd like to make is, is that the West does not understand or appreciate uh, the Global South's problems, but is insisting that they take certain steps here that favor the West. The second point I think is that the reason why the Global South is acting like it is, is that to them, history matters. Many of the countries in the G7 are members of a Western alliance that is formally comprising the colonial powers that had control over many of these countries in, in, in the global south. And these countries also remember that it was the former Soviet Union who stood by them during their struggle for independence and afterwards. 
that is the second reason I felt that the global south is acting the way it is. And the third reason is that they feel that the Ukraine is not our war. It is more a war that is for the future of Europe rather than the future for the entire world. But it is being presented as a war that is for the entire world. And the global south is resisting that labeling. The fourth point I would like to make is that the global south views the future that is no longer Western led or Western dominated. There are other players that are emerging, including China and Russia and India and Brazil. And the dependence that the global south has had on Western institutions is changing. So they are also looking to the future as to where their, uh, their destiny, their future, their health is most likely to come. And that is one of the motivations. And the last point is that the so-called rules-based international order under which the West is telling the global south to sanction Russia lacks credibility and is in decline in the eyes of many countries in, in the global south. And I'll explain that further as we go along, because they, it seems like these rules are made more for the convenience of the West than it is for a world order in which all of us can sign on to. So basically, the South, global South is making a plea for peace. They want to stay neutral. Uh, they don't want to take sides. They don't want to fuel the flames of this war, which they feel will make the crisis even worse and, and risks further escalation. It is for these reasons, I think, that the Global South is taking the position that it is. Thank you for that outline. And to sort of to dig in on some of your points, um, the first one I wanted to follow up on was, you know, why does the Global South believe that the West does not understand or empathize with its problems? Well, you know, India's foreign minister, Mr. Jay Shankar, made a very revealing comment recently when he said that the West has to get out of the mindset that the West's problems are the world's problems, but the world's problems are not the West's problems. You know, I repeat, the West has to get out of the mindset that the West's problems are the world's problems, but the world's problems are not the West's problems. And I'll give the recent pandemic as a, as a perfect example. As you know, the intellectual property for the vaccines was not shared by the West. And Africa remains the most unvaccinated continent in the world. By mid-2021, uh, one in four persons in the West had been vaccinated. But in many of the low-income countries of the global South, the vaccination was one in 500. But help did come from, from Russia, from China, from India. By, by early 2021, uh, in Algeria, for example, the Russia Sputnik vaccine really launched the vaccination program in Algeria. Around the same time in Egypt, it was China's Sinopharm vaccine that launched the program there. In South Africa, uh, South Africa received about a million doses from India's Serum Institute. Argentina, be, uh, uh, for Argentina, Sputnik from Russia again became the backbone of its vaccination program. So all of this was happening while the West was buying vaccines at very high prices and then dumping them when they got outdated. And you know, the Global South is saying, here was a real problem that affected us. Where were you when we needed this help? And what will happen in the next pandemic? So, so, so basically, the Global South is saying <clears throat> that, look, our problems are real. The pandemic, <clears throat> poverty, poverty alleviation, debt service, uh, famine, malnutrition, and so forth. And, and when these problems we are facing and we need help from the West, we get very modest or limited help. And now you're telling us, to please take your side on this issue, and which is why I feel that they are so hesitant. Yeah, and, and in your article, you also out, outlined some of the colonial, colonial history of the Global South and why that may have a bearing on the current stance that many countries in the Global South are taking. Why is the colonial, colonial history important to understand, and how does that have an impact on what we're seeing today? Ryan, the main reason is that Many people in the Global South, me included, 
remember our colonial history much better than people in the West do. Um, and they see their former colonial powers regrouped as Western Alliance members of EU or NATO. Now, I'll give you just one example. Uh, I come from India, and as you know, India was a colony for almost 150 years of United Kingdom. Now, the GDP of Britain today is around $3 trillion. But many studies have proven that over the 150 years of colonial history of India with the UK, almost $40 trillion of wealth was taken from India alone to the United Kingdom. And India was not the only colony of Britain. You know, there were colonies in Africa, in Asia, in, in the Middle East, in, in the Americas, and many of the other countries in the, in the G7, you know, the uh, countries in Italy and France and uh, many of the Western Alliance members that are sanctioning Russia, including Netherlands and Belgium and Spain, Portugal and so forth, are, are members of this alliance, which the Global South has been a receiving end of many of these countries, including the United States. I mean, if you think about it, many American children don't know that uh, California, New Mexico, Texas were all part of Mexico at one time. And it was that war in the mid 19th century that the US waged against Mexico that resulted in these territories becoming annexed and becoming part of, of the United States. So, so, so basically these countries have been at the receiving end of, of, um, uh, of the G7, which are now sanctioning Russia. And they are saying, look, we, we, we have a different interpretation of your wishes because we have also been taken advantage of or exploited by these countries. But there's another very important fundamental reason, Ryan, that I think people need to understand, your listeners would appreciate. And that is that during the struggle for independence in the Global South, these countries remember that it was the former Soviet Union that stood by them during their struggle for independence. In fact, Nelson, Nelson Mandela used to say that it was the moral and material support of the Soviet Union that inspired the, the African, Southern Africans to rise up against apartheid and succeed. And I know that uh, other countries were similarly benefiting from that support from the former Soviet Union. Um, and even once independence came, even though the Soviet Union had limited resources, they really helped many of these countries in the Global South. As an example, the Asman Dam that was built from 1959 to 1971, one of the largest infrastructure projects in Egypt, was designed and built by the Hydro Project Institute in Moscow. I grew up in India and I remember in 1959, the Bhilai uh, steel plant, which was one of the largest infrastructure projects in India, was again given by the Soviet Union to India. And there were a number of other countries that were benefited from, from, from that experience, including Ghana, Angola, Mozambique, Ethiopia, Sudan, Uganda, Mali. Now, some would say that Russia is not the former Soviet Union, and I agree, Russia is not a communist country. But in the eyes of the global south, it is still viewed as the ideological successor of the Soviet Union, which stood by them in a very critical time of their need. And they remember their history much more so than the West does. And, and now when the West says sanction Russia, they say, no, thank you. And one has to ask, can you blame them? Yes, thank you for explaining that history, which is very important, or, or some of the history. Um, an, another point um, that you make earlier that's very powerful and you make very powerfully in the article um, is, is that, quote, the Ukraine war is not our war. Uh, what do you mean by that? What I mean by that, Ryan, is that many, to many countries in the global south, the Ukraine war is seen as the war about the future of Europe rather than the future of the entire world. Uh, the global south recognizes that this is part of the G7 strategy for the containment of Russia along the pathway of the containment of, of China and, and NATO expansion is a part of, of, of this containment, 
which, as you know, there were promises made to Russia that if Russia would agree to the reunification of Germany, there would not be an expansion of NATO one inch to the east. Those were the promises made in the Clinton Albright administration. Russia agreed to the unification under those promises, which were both oral and written. But as time passed and Russia was in a weaker state, the expansion continued. The red line that Russia continued to establish, that there will be no expansion of NATO into Ukraine, into Georgia, was constantly being violated. And then we finally reached a crisis point where Ukraine was to become a member of NATO and in fact was a de facto member of NATO by the arms that were continuously being provided to Ukraine. So even though the West likes to say that this was an unprovoked war, the truth is that there are many more reasons for this war happening than is presented in the Western narrative. I mean, you have kindly interviewed one of my colleagues at Yale, Ben Abilo, who wrote the book, How the West Provoked the War in Ukraine, which explains some of these circumstances. But, you know, in the Western narrative, explanations like this are not very much in the mainstream. And so not many people really understand or appreciate that. And I think there's another part of this war that the global South understands much better than the West. And that is that as a result of this geopolitical struggle that is taking place in between the G7 and Russia, it is the global South that is paying a very high price because of higher food prices, fertilizer, higher energy prices. And uh, in many instances, even if Russia wants to provide food and uh, fertilizer to the grain and fertilizer to the developing countries, their ships are being blocked in Western ports, they cannot get insurance. So everything is rising as a result of this war and uh, the global South is suffering for a situation that is more a great power rivalry or a competition that is detrimentally, uh, having a detrimental effect on the global South. In fact, there was a study done by an organization called Nature Energy that 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 uh, came to the conclusion that as a result of this war, almost 140 million people in the global south will be pushed into extreme poverty because of this higher food prices and fertilizer prices, energy prices, and the cost of debt service. You know, that's an important point because the West can issue debt to help tide their, their countrymen through this war. As you know, EU has issued almost $800 billion of debt to subsidize households and businesses as a result of the higher energy prices. The West can do it as long as it takes, but the Global South cannot do it. They do not have the ability or the opportunity to issue debt to get over these problems. So uh, it's, it's a real um, uh, difficult situation for the Global South where they are ending up at the receiving end of a geopolitical battle between the G7 and Russia for which they are paying a very, very high price. And that's why they think that this is not our war. This is a war that's been imposed on us as a result of these geopolitical rivalries. And we want to stay out of it. We want to be neutral. We don't want to add uh, fuel to the fire and please accept our position in this regard. Yeah, that, and that leads to I think another important point you made in the article, I think they tie well with each other. And, and that is the point that you made that not the only game in town, you know, that the global South does not, does have other options. Um, and what do you mean by that? Well, I think in the past, especially after the independence of these newly, newly uh, these countries in the global South, uh, it was mainly the West, the IMF, the World Bank, the Western countries to which these countries would look to for help or for loans and so forth. But now a whole different paradigm is emerging in a, in a multipolar world that we are seeing, where China particularly is playing an important role in terms of financing, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of manufacturing. Russia is playing an important role in terms of energy and food and fertilizer. And there are other options that the Global South have, has other than what they had before. And if you just look at the economies of the G7 and the, and the BRICS countries, for example, G7 in 2021 had a GDP of around 41 trillion. 
the BRICS countries, the Brazil, um, China, Russia, India, and South Africa had a combined GDP of around 42 trillion. The population of the G7 is around 700 million, whereas the population of the BRICS countries is around 3.2 billion, four and a half times. Then you look at how the economies of the G7, they are right now in a, in a state of uh, uh, either, either st uh, static or not growing, or in some cases in Britain and Germany, almost a negative growth is expected, whereas the economies in the BRICS countries is continuing to grow. And as you know, the BRICS are expanding, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is expanding, so that enables the Global South to have a much wider platform than they did before for financing, for manufacturing, for um, um, loans that they may need as, as, as alternatives to the IMF and the World Bank are emerging through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, through China, and so on. So these countries are saying, uh, well, we do have other options, and West is not the only game in town. And I don't know if you may, may have seen that news that just a couple of months ago, uh, in a couple of weeks ago, there was African leaders had convened in Moscow and uh, President Putin uh, said that Russia was forgiving $20 billion worth of loans that it had provided to the African countries for food and energy. That was very well received by those African countries. And statistically, I think, don't know if your listeners are aware that, that over the past 20 years, China has provided around $900 billion of loans to about 150 low-income countries in the Global South over the past 20 years. Now, that's a very important statistic. We have 193 countries in the world. 153 of those countries, which are mainly in the Global South, have received $900 billion worth of loans from China alone over the past 20 years. So you see, they are looking at a future that is different from what it was before, where the West was the only game in town. Now they're seeing their opportunities in, in, uh, with China, with BRICS, with Shanghai Cooperation Count Organization, with an alternative to the IMF that is uh, feasible through the resources of China. And they're saying, must we always listen to the West in terms of making our policies? Could there be a future in a multipolar world that is more beneficial to us? And that's what they are hoping for and supporting. And that's why they are staying ambivalent. They're staying uh, away from the commands or the dictates of the West to sanction Russia, because they're saying that Russia and China and BRICS and SCO are important for our future. And we don't want to rule out those options as we plan for the future uh, <clears throat> support and uh, stability of our countries. Do you, uh, do you know offhand? I mean, I re you were discussing the nine hundred billion that that China's given to the to the global south primarily, and I and I recall reading, but I don't recall if this is accurate, that China has given more in financial support, whether it's loans or otherwise, than the World Bank and IMF combined. Is that does that sound accurate to you? That is accurate. And, and I'll give you another important statistic, Ryan. In 2021 alone, a number of countries as a result of the pandemic needed uh, emergency loans. The IMF provided around $30 billion worth of emergency loans to these countries. China provided around $42 billion of emergency rescue loans to Sri Lanka, to Argentina, even to Turkey, much more than the IMF. And the last time the United States provided an emergency loan was to Uruguay of around 1.2 billion in 2002. So you see how China has totally overtaken the West in terms of providing financial aid, emergency loans, something that was tra had traditionally been the opportunity for the West to provide support, but now that position has been taken over by China and the organizations that they are a part of, including the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Yeah, and, and the other point which you touched on earlier and is also in your article is you discussed the so-called rules-based order uh, propagated by the U.S. and its North Atlantic allies, uh, which the, these allies use to justify their position on war, 
and frankly, military aggression across the globe. Um, what is this, the Global South's response to the U.S. and its allies' use of, of the kind of quote unquote rules-based order to justify its military provocations and aggression in the Ukraine and beyond? Well, I think this is something, the rules-based international order is the premise under which the G7 is saying that the Global South must support them in sanctioning Russia. But one has to really ask, does, do these rules even apply to the West? As an example, under what rules for its, uh, did, did the, the G7 countries, part of NATO, invade? the former Yugoslavia, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, insurrection that was fostered in Syria, which is still ongoing. If there were some rules-based international orders, why were they not supported by United Nations or Security Council resolutions? Why was it something that the West unilaterally did because they could do it, you know, in a sense? So they have these rules that are conceived by the West and then imposed unilaterally on others. It is few, if any, non-Western countries ever signed up for these rules, but then these rules are being used to justify the sanctions uh, against Russia. Now, in addition to the countries invaded, and if you, if you think about the rules-based international order, um, the G7 countries have sanctions on over 40 countries today, which is causing tremendous death, destruction, uh, instability in those countries. As you know, Venezuela is a very poor country and is at a subsistence level. And the Venezuelan gold has been frozen in, in, in London, not allowed to be accessed for the welfare of their people. The Afghan reserves have been frozen in, 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 in the West. So under what rules are these decisions be, being taken? The Global South has to right, rightfully ask. Uh, under what rules is Assange being kept in prison just because he had the courage or the audacity to expose some of the violations of these rules-based orders? Under what rules is, is Snowden exiled to, to Russia for, again, revealing some of the violations of, of these so-called rules that have taken place? And, you know, if Sai Hirsch's assertion is correct about Nord Stream Pipeline, the what rules based on is that act of terrorism committed, which many people believe was was done in, in, in cooperation of the United States and Denmark and Norway and so forth. So, you know, if on the one hand we feel that people should follow these rules, then it is important that if these rules are to have credibility and, uh, and, uh, and uh, acceptance by the Global South, then the West also should should follow these rules. So um, there's a sense in the global south that these rules are made by the West to promote the West's interests and they lack credibility are in decline and the global south should not feel that they should necessarily honor these rules just because the West is saying so. And you know there's some good reason to to feel that these arguments are somewhat valid. Yeah and, and kind of on the um to jump on the other side of the coin, uh, there's China, and China is sort of emerging as a leader in building peace and stability around the world. They even somehow brought Iran and Saudi Arabia to the table. Um, and earlier this week, there was a, there were lots of signs that peace between Saudi Arabia and Syria may be developing, which is a positive ripple effect of, of China's leadership. Um, how is this viewed by the global south, and does this presents some prospects of potentially ending the war? in Ukraine? I think the role that China has played in bringing uh, 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 Iran and Saudi Arabia together has been very, very important. And this is something that I don't think has gotten sufficient press in, in, in the Western media. Uh, as you know, this deal was jump-started by Russia in Baghdad and Oman and brought to a closure by China in Beijing. And there are major implications to this. First, very major implication is that it is saying that Chinese and Russian diplomacy can replace what has traditionally been Western militarism, somewhat role of the United States and Israel in that region, which has not really helped stabilize the situation 
But if Iran and Saudi Arabia can come together, then tremendous stability can, can be achieved in that region. Iran can also now actively participate in OPEC and find markets for its oil as a result of this deal once Saudi Arabia and Iran have made up. And, and they are two very important members of OPEC. But Iran has been unable to sell a lot of its oil because of sanctions. And now with this arrangement, that could change. There is stage now set for ending the war in Yemen. And Saudi Arabia, as you know, has just, uh, the crown prince has just issued uh, a declaration to the effect that the Saudi Arabian parliament has been informed about a change stance that Saudi Arabia is now going to take with respect to Yemen. So if there could be peace as a result of this in Yemen, it could have a very big uh, uh, impact. Then already, if, if Iran and Saudi Arabia are at peace, that will also have a moderating influence on Turkey. Because if its neighbors are at peace, then Turkey also will probably in, be involved in less interference in, in this region. So I think uh, this is a very important development. It shows that China and Russia can play a role in diplomacy in a region that has been torn by strife. And the more there is peace in the region, the more that Iran and Saudi Arabia and the other countries in the Middle East, including Egypt can, and, and Turkey, can become members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, can become members of BRICS. It just increases the potential for a most, more peaceful region in the Middle East. Now, that is also creating an opportunity that if China is successful in brokering these deals between countries, can the peace proposals that they have offered with regard to Ukraine also have a possibility? Now, even though the West has sort of um, denied the, the bona fides of that proposal and is not entertaining it. The fact is, what we see right now with, with Macron in Beijing, with Ursula von der Leyen in Beijing, with uh, uh, President Lula of Brazil coming to Beijing shortly, uh, there is a sense that China can play a more peaceful role going forward, having already achieved some success in the Middle East, which has been a source of great tensions. At least that's the hope of the Global South, because the more role that China can play in this regard, uh, the better it would be for uh, more players to emerge that are powerful players that can have a role for peace and stability in the world, rather than just a unipolar world ruled and dominated by the West but a multipolar world where China and Russia and Brazil and India and other countries can play a role, that I think has positive implications for the global South. Yen, I don't know if, if you want to add thoughts on this. I didn't um, send you this question in advance, but did you have additional thoughts or reactions to uh, Ursula von der Leyen's and, and Emmanuel Macron's trip to Beijing that you thought might be uh, relevant for our audience? I think it is basically saying that, that the West is looking at an off-ramp to a, a situation in Ukraine that has gone off course. I, I think the West probably expected that there would be a collapse in Russia within a few weeks, with them being cut off from SWIFT, with the ruble collapsing, and that has not happened. Uh, the Western economies are paying a very high price as a result of this war. There's been inflation, there's been heavy debt that these countries have taken on. Um, Germany is experiencing a deindustrialization that they have never experienced before. Their economy that has always been growing is now facing a potential recession. Public sentiment is changing in these countries. Uh, many governments that were very pro-war in the past, as you know, just last few days ago, Sanna Marin in Finland lost her uh, premiership. So, so I think these leaders are noticing that the winds are changing. This war has dragged on a lot longer than they expected, that it is not helpful to their economies. It has caused tremendous devastation in Ukraine. The Global South is not supporting us in this war. Can China play a role? in bringing about peace. And I think that's the reason for this mission. And I hope that that mission can succeed. Um, and, and how has the recent visit by President Xi to Moscow been perceived by the Global South? And what do you see as some of the long-term implications of that historic meeting? I think this is a very historic development because 
both Russia and China are seen as very important part of the future for the global south. And if they are working closely together, it is sending a positive message for these countries. You know, for example, as I, as I said before, Russia is the source of food, fertilizer, and energy for the global south. China is the source for financing, manufacturing, and infrastructure. And if these two countries are working together, then these six ingredients that are very important for the global south are more likely to be made available to them as times go forward. And especially if institutions are created through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization that compete with the IMF, that can provide financing, that again is a very positive sign. Another implication of this that I think has not been uh, acknowledged too much in the Western press is that as these trading zones expand as a result of China and Russia coming closer together as BRICS and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization expand, and trade takes place in currencies other than the dollar, it creates an opportunity for the global south to reduce its dependence on the dollar. And in, as you know, very often when the West try, has desires to impose their wishes on certain countries, um, they can put sanctions and access to the dollar becomes a very important part of, of the crisis that comes about in those countries. So if these countries can move away from the dollar and trade more in yuan, in ruble, in rupees, and reduce that dependence, it also creates somewhat of a more stable environment for them going forward, rather than being absolutely dependent on, on the West. So I think this, this um, development has long-term implications. We won't see immediate impact right now, but it puts more um, uh, flesh to the bones of a multipolar world that I think we are evolving towards, which the Global South feels is in their best interest in terms of future financing, manufacturing, energy, food, and so forth. And uh, time will tell if that will materialize. Um, um, I, my, my only concern is that right before uh, this meeting took place, there were a lot of threats on China on not supplying weapons to, you, to Russia. Um, there was, on the eve of that meeting, the ICC issued its warrant against President Putin, um, again, to embarrass the two countries. So I don't know if, if, if the, the, the uh, uh, meetings such as this are viewed amicably by the West or are viewed as a threat, but certainly for the Global South, which is the group that I'm from, it is viewed very positively. Yeah, and um, as we look forward um, to the future, uh, since peace is, is the ultimate objective for all of us, what do you see are some of the pathways to peace that may help end the current crisis in Ukraine? Well, that's the, that's the ultimate question that I think many people are struggling with, many countries are struggling with. Um, as we talked earlier, many leaders are in China right now. Um, we almost came to a very peaceful resolution in Istanbul last April, which for various reasons were then withdrawn by Ukraine, uh, pushed perhaps by UK, US and other countries. Um, you know, at a fundamental level, Ryan, this is a proxy war between US and Russia between NATO with US at its head and Russia. And, and the truth is that eventually for a resolution, US and Russia have to come to terms about ending this war and the security agreements that will exist once this war is over. Russia had presented security treaties in December 2021 before the war started, which were totally ignored by the West maybe a silver lining that can come about as a result of this war is that those treaties can then be renegotiated. The INF treaty, the IBM, um, ABN treaty can, can be re-looked at as we go forward. But right now, um, my sense is that this, this proxy war is going on. Countries are getting very tired. It is becoming very expensive. Ukraine is getting devastated in the process. 
and pathways to peace have to be found. As you know, the Pope has offered to go to Ukraine and Russia to help mediate peace. Uh, President Lula of Brazil has offered his, his uh, services in this regard. Prime Minister Modi has made some initiatives. And, you know, I remember back in the 50s and 60s when there was a non-aligned movement, when, when, uh, when Gamal Abdel Nasser from Egypt, Tito from Yugoslavia, Nehru from India, Chow Lai from China, uh, Kwame Nukrumah from Ghana, Soekarno from Indonesia, all were part of the Lawn Aligned movement aligned with neither Soviet Union or Russia and working towards peace. And I think what is happening now is the opportunity for a similar to non-aligned movement where the global South, 80% of the world's population is saying, we wish to neither sanction Russia nor support the West. And I think this opportunity of a global South that is, that is uh, uh, wanting peace is hurt by this war and wants this war to end. I hope that this opportunity can be taken, taken forward. You know, I remember also, I think many people in America may not, not know this, I'm sure lo your listeners might, is that Russia and America have never really been adversaries. And if you think about it, back in the Revolutionary War, when uh, America got its independence, Great Britain went to Catherine the Great and said, let us form an alliance to defeat the American revolutionaries. You provide 20,000 troops, and we will go to war with the Americans. Catherine the Great said, no, we will not participate in that. Again, in the Civil War, France and Britain appealed to Tsar Alexander II and said, let us form a collaboration and support the Confederacy against the Union. Tsar Alexander not only said no, but he sent Russian naval ships both to the East Coast and the West Coast to prevent the naval uh, intervention by Britain and France in support of the Confederacy. So in the Revolutionary War, in the Civil War, Russia has supported the United States. In the First World War, they were not adversaries. Russia exited the First World War before America intervened, but they were on the same side in, in fighting Germany. In the Second World War, Russia and the Soviet Union were allies. So historically, these countries Country have not been. This is time in the post uh, World War II period that this crisis has come about, and I hope that that saner voices will prevail and recognize the historical connections that Russia and the United States have had, and there'll be efforts on both sides to work towards peace. Uh, that is my hope, and uh, and as you know, um, world opinion is changing. I mentioned the protests in Europe that are taking place. There was a survey done about a year ago which said that one in 10 Republicans support, felt that U.S. was providing too much support to Ukraine. And now it is almost 50% of Republicans feel this way. So I think even the mood is shifting partly because people want this war to end. It's not helping any country. And, uh, and uh, we hope that such peace can come about. That's certainly, certainly my, my desire and expectation. Yeah, we share. We very, we very much share those sentiments, um, and we hope that a, a broader and, a, and more rigorous peace, mo peace movement grows in the U.S. and, and across the West generally. Um, those are all the questions we have for you for today. Is there anything you wanted to add before we close? Um, Ryan, the only thing I would add, as you know, I come from the Hindu tradition, and uh, in our sacred text in the Mahabharata. There is a very interesting question that is posed by Arjuna to Lord Krishna, where he says, how should one treat the other? That's the question that is posed. And Lord Krishna replies that there is no other, that we are the same. And I think that teaching from our sacred text, which is common to most religions, is something that we need to think about more because there is no other, Russia, Ukraine, the West, the Global South, we all have the same desires and expectations for our children, for our grandchildren's future. And we hope that that realization will be manifest in the future as things go forward. Yes, that is an excellent uh, quote. Thank you for sharing that. And
Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been an honor speaking with you and learning from you some more, and, and we hope to have you back again soon. Thank you for this opportunity. <laughs>